What's your carnal theory? Hey there, you're listening to Carnal Theory, where we talk with experts from around the world to learn how taking command of our sexual story affects our personal wellness, sexual experiences, and relationships with ourselves and others. All right. Hi, everybody. I'm Abba. And I'm Amanda. And today on Carnal Theory, we are joined by Emily DePass, a sex and relationship expert who's on a mission to provide accurate and inclusive information on some of society's most misunderstood and shame-fueled topics. In 2019, Emily founded Sex Education, which is providing resources for those working through a positive STI diagnosis, trying to find their authentic voices in their relationships, and also for educators who are seeking a more comprehensive approach to confronting these stigmas in the classroom. Emily, thank you so much for being here today. We are really excited to have you. I'm really excited to start this conversation with both of you. It's an important conversation and you're you're a knowledgeable expert to be able to have it with. So thank you. As a, as a reminder for our guests, we like to kick off each episode by starting with our guests proposing a kernel theory for us to consider. And this theory, it's something that uh, might challenge a, a presumption or a perception that we might have in, in life and, and the world and our sexuality. And uh, we'll talk about that a little bit and talk about some other things uh, that Emily is involved with. And then at the end of the episode, we will revisit this theory to see if maybe even during the course of this conversation, our perceptions or presumptions might have changed. Um, and so this, this month with our theme of breaking down the STI stigma, Emily, can you share with us the theory that you've brought for our consideration? So my theory is that we all know at least one person, if not more, with or who has a sexually transmitted infection. Yeah, without, without question, that seems pretty accurate. <laughs> but if you asked me this when I was in high school or if I was just learning about sex, I'd say no way. Like, that's impossible. It seems that way. It seems like, so we have been doing a little bit of research on STIs and um, their, like, the global rates of them. And I came across a stat, um, um, statistic from the World Health Organization that a million people are diagnosed every day across the whole world. Yeah. It's amazing. It's like astounding. And it feels so isolating for both, right? It's completely the opposite of what so many people think of what we're taught because we're never really taught that these are normal or everyday occurrences. And yet, like you said, million diagnoses every day. Yeah. One of the things, one of your strong suits of what you offer and, and why you have such a large following is you create these wonderful resources for people to be able to use and tap into. And um, Thank you. you're welcome, <laughs> much deserved. Um, and uh, we've shared some in the past and, and leading up to this interview, I was looking at some of them again. And I, I, w- we have a tendency to, to loop into the systemic look of why mm-hmm. these issues are are at the forefront or why they haven't been looked at deeper and i i just want to call out a a post of yours and then how you've kind of broken it down i think that it sets a a good foundation of looking at maybe why these things haven't been addressed more completely because you already mentioned education and how growing up it just wasn't on on the table so to read one of your Uh, more recent posts, you say uh, society's discomfort and shame around genital herpes and other STIs doesn't stem from the infections or their symptoms. Rather, society is uncomfortable with their association to sexual origin. And then uh, jumping from from that, you, you give a great graphic of the layers of herpes and STI stigma um, and you have this great graph as a, as a visual for our listeners, you have like the, you, it's like a bullseye. Exactly. Kind of. Yeah, exactly. On, on point, on point. Um, yeah, you have the, you at the center of the bullseye and then rippling out from that, you have these different layers, these, these systemic layers of what 
in, ends up influencing you and how you view, uh, you know, this concept STIs, but realistically it's our entire sexuality. So stemming out from there, you have legislation of policy, which a hotter and hotter topic <laughs> to be, to be discussed in the coming every, every day. It seems <laughs> indeed. Um, so legislation and policy, sex education and experience, what we just talked about uh, a little bit there, school, religion, and families, uh, media, and popular culture. Um, and I was curious, in, in, in the work of trying to create the understanding that this is a systemic issue, how do you see people starting to mentally break this stigma down and, and like reflect upon it and deal with it. So I believe that people aren't really confronted with even breaking down stigma until they really know someone who says, Hey, I have herpes or I have cold sores and that's herpes too. Or a friend that discloses or a partner that says, Hey, by the way, when was your last STI screening? Um, and by the way, you know, I have herpes. I just want you to know before we engage. So my personal experience and from chatting with others is that you don't really, you're not confronting it until you have to, right? We live in this place of ignorance and it's not necessarily our fault because as you said, it's, it's a systemic issue. We've got sex education that is often lacking. Uh, even more comprehensive sex ed still could bolster itself up with regard to narratives around STIs. You've got legislation and policy uh, that aren't inclusive to all populations and specifically limit access to more marginalized populations. And our country has a history of uh, presuming, especially women specifically, are the carriers of STIs. So there's an added stigma there. Um, and then you just have your friends and your media groups that kind of reinforce each other from what you see on television. You know, how often do we see a show on television that doesn't put herpes as a joke, but rather invites people into a conversation that it's a real human thing that happens to a million people every day. Yeah, I think it's interesting that there's obviously a number of issues that face us in, in 2020 and have for a while. And I think that so many of them just miss that link of getting humanized and uh, climate change comes to mind. Like we think of this as this something other and when we start to humanize it, that's right. actually a part of our story. We start to go like, oh, I know climate change. Oh, I know STIs. Mm -hmm. Like it becomes when you make it human, when you make it personal, mm -hmm. people start to be like, all right, so maybe we need to deal with this. Maybe we need to look at this. Do you see, you, you, you mentioned media and, and culture. Are there like magazines, what, what are, uh, you know, other than, you know, coming on to your account or getting onto Instagram and, and stumbling across a STI educational platform, like are there, do you see resources starting to emerge? Do you see conversations starting to come out? So in the last five years that I've really been public and doing this work, I do believe there is more conversation. There are more people actively involved and willing to start that conversation and educate. Even people, you know, I have people emailing me saying, how do I start talking about STIs or STI stigma, specifically wanting to make their niche in that, which is really cool. So I do think we're in a better place. Um, I don't know that it will be eliminated during our lifetime, but I'm hopeful that these conversations, as you very well said, uh, will become more human. Yeah. I, I think there's also a lot of misplaced fear around them where people think, um, like, for example, uh, people see getting an HIV positive um, test as basically a death sentence. And it's mm -hmm. like the scariest thing that you could ever get. But in reality, like medicine has gone a long way in terms of supporting people who are tested positive. Um, if let's say, for example, you are tested positive for HIV, isn't, isn't it pretty much that you just take medicine as a treatment at this point? Like what do, do you know about that? Right, it's a manageable, 
it's a manageable infection. You know, obviously that varies by each person's biology and with their doctor and what works for them, but largely like similar to herpes, it's manageable. Every STI is either curable, treatable, manageable. Right. And so that would just be another level of like education and education, not doing its part in supporting. Cause for me, when I was in, in high school, we did, we had a brief sex education class that was a few weeks long and they just showed us these images of STIs and they were like, this will happen to you. Like be oh afraid. Like was do it the public it. or private institution? Public. Okay. Yeah. In Massachusetts, in Massachusetts. Um, so it's like a little bit more, uh, open. Like there's a little bit, we learned, I think I had much better than some people, but a lot of the discussion around STIs was totally fear-based and none of it was equipping us, um, with the knowledge of what happens after you do get one. Or Um, how to communicate with partners or how to navigate a positive diagnosis because people I feel like are diagnosed and they think, you know, their love life and life is over and no one will accept them. But we, we haven't been given the tools to navigate such conversations or to know that there are routes available to us. Do you think that that lack of communication education directly contributes to STIs continuing to spread? You know, it's so funny you say that because I was thinking about that recently. Um, and I, I do think that that's part of it. And I also think that mandated testing plays a role in that as well. And, you know, I've just made a post today on different types of herpes tests and screenings and things like that. Um, but the CDC doesn't include that in STI screening, you know, in your regular all-inclusive test. Uh, and there are several reasons for that. But there are arguments and people go back and forth. And even I go back and forth with myself in my head sometimes about, you know, should herpes be included? Because everyone does pretty much have one kind of herpes. Um, You know, the psychological impact is a lot with the stigma. But I also think it would really encourage conversation and help to normalize it as something like, oh, like, it's just herpes. Like, I'd, I'd love to get to that point where I'm surrounded by people or receive messages that say, you know, I'm in this place where I feel like it's just herpes, like it's okay. Um, but yeah, I, I do think that plays a role. And what, what kind of resources I'm going to go with in the classroom to start, uh, it's where we, where we need to be starting. What kind of resources do you see needing to be there in order to make longer term change? So I think you need to have I think we need to integrate more sex positive pleasure-based conversations all around sex ed. So I don't think we should necessarily, you know, I know it's hard as an educator breaking things down by days or topics or lessons, but I really think you need to make an effort as an educator to be inclusive throughout your, the time you have with your students. You know, how does, how does pleasure-based sex play with people with STIs? How does barrier methods, how does that impact that population? So really making a more inclusive effort um, to share, you know, and I think statistics are helpful because they do give that pathway like, wow, like I didn't know that. But how many of us really learned that the most common symptom of the most common symptoms of STIs is no symptom at all? You know, like like Amanda was saying, you know, you you were taught to fear them and fear these most extreme cases likely of lesions or warts or whatever they were. Um, but instead of, to t- instead of teaching about how to approach or treat the symptom, I think we really need to approach how to engage in that communication with our partners, with ourselves, um, self-advocating with our practitioners. I think those are the conversations that we really need to instill in our students and in our friend groups too. What does it mean to self-advocate with your practitioner? So unfortunately, specifically for herpes, because it's not a mandated test, um, doctors will say, you know, well, the CDC says that you don't really, you don't have to have it and you're not, you're presenting symptoms. So you don't really need it. Um, So advocating for your health in that sense, um, you know, 
being able to say, Hey, you know, I've done my research and, you know, I slept with a partner who had herpes and I'd really just like to know for myself and for my future partners. And, you know, this is the test I want. Or for more marginalized populations, um, unfortunately, they shouldn't have to do more emotional labor than there is. But sadly, that's the case, especially with regard to guidelines around STIs. So with more marginalized populations, you know, LGBTQ, race, all of those factors play into uh, self-advocating and really creating space for yourself and your identity to have open conversations with your practitioners. And as much as I wish and hope that all of our healthcare providers are equipped with the knowledge that we need to make the best decisions for us, sadly, legislation isn't necessarily on our side. Um, and sometimes I, I often feel that there's a missing component to uh, you know, gynecology offices or healthcare offices, sexual health. I feel like there needs to be a sexual health advocate there or someone in place because most medical professionals don't get the human sexuality knowledge that they really need to engage in some of these conversations with people. And I think that often really affects a positive diagnosis. You know, someone might, you know, like Amanda was saying, have that fear show up and someone, a practitioner might just be very cold or come off cold unintentionally, but they might not have the knowledge or the skill set to navigate the psychological impact of that diagnosis. Mm. That That's a really like, interesting perspective. Yeah, that feels like such a failed profession or that we have failed in how to, what a doctor means. I, I, I like the idea of there being a separate person who's an mm-hmm. advocate. I, I can see the argument and the scenario where, okay, this the, the doctor is trained so specifically on all the technicalities of right. the sexual organ, like they, the, the mental health, you know, part of it, like I, I get how that could be, how it could make sense to be someone else. Um, Right. And I feel it is failed that if, if especially in like an OBGYN scenario, if someone is literally specialized in this sex organ, that the sexual health component isn't factored in just seems like a, or just, you know, presumption, you know, (laughs) like having to report, you know, well, how many new partners do you have? And I understand that that helps them determine which tests to give, but it also, um, you know, we all have a bias and how does that show up in the clinic? How does that show up in the the healthcare room with your patients? Right. Uh, and I'm, to be honest, I'm not sure what that looks like in medical schools, if that's something you evaluate or how that works, but, uh, it's definitely something that we carry with us, unconscious bias everywhere. Yes. We, we, we talked about racism and sex last month. Mm-hmm. That was our theme. And one of the things that we discussed was the, the unconscious bias and maybe explicitly taught bias in the medical realm of, and how that plays into my minorities. Mm-hmm. And color. Um, so yeah, to, to think that it doesn't, to, you know, to see what's going on in our world and see how it like very, clearly comes out through police brutality like yes it's 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 another component of our of our systems as well let's not pretend like it isn't or be blind to it it doesn't benefit whether you are a person of color or not it doesn't benefit any of us mm-hmm. to ignore it being there mm-hmm. or put a blind eye to it this idea um of you know an advocate that works in at these various different offices, maybe an OBGYN or, or Planned Parenthood or something like that, um, makes me think of, I have a friend who's an abortion doula or who ha- mm-hmm. was a practicing abortion doula who would um, go in with the people who were having an abortion and be there for them because you can't bring your partners into these right. in most states. Um, and is there as just, you know, someone who supports you and your voice and makes sure that you are getting the information you need um, and to have that for, you know, so so many other things just makes sense Um, in situations that are highly emotional and highly like can have a lot of trauma attached to them. That's a really great parallel. Really great parallel. And yeah, even I, with my OBGYN, um, you know, 
I go in and I'm like, oh yeah, me, you know, human sexuality person. And it's, it's not met with the same level of enthusiasm. She's, you know, they're like, well, I'm here to look at your genitals, make sure, you know, we're all up to speed. And I'm like, well, I want to talk about this aspect of it. Um, and you know, sometimes I've actually gone back and forth with providers and doctors just on philosophy and things like that. And it's, it's a really hard conversation to have. There's often, uh, both of, both parties are very stubborn and very in their own sphere. So I think there needs to be a way to mesh them together, to come to a place where we can meet. uh, And maybe that advocate could be someone to perform that role. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And having those in classrooms too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Maybe it is too much to expect the teachers to be able to teach all of that. Maybe there needs to be a specialist that comes in. Or like the counselor that you have, someone who specializes in that, especially if it's, you know, when you're getting to ages, middle school, high school, where you know that you're starting to be curious and explore more. Support is key. We healing community. Yeah. Is there someone doing this? So so you were saying um, that a lot of the reasons for you know, not having herpes testing is for the lack of legislation. Um, Is there people doing work to try and fight for that legislation so that we can have, you know, access to this information? So I'm not really sure, to be honest with you. I haven't come across anyone. I will say that in research, I am consistently disappointed uh, in kind of a research healthcare crossover, the lack of inclusivity in for LGBTQ folks, especially. I did an article a couple of years back and interviewed queer women on their experiences of herpes and their diagnoses and the amount of women that shared with me that, you know, their doctor was like, well, we don't really have any guidelines for you. So, Mm. you know, just, you know, it was just like, it was really hard for me to sit with reading and listening to people have that same response collectively. And it didn't seem that anyone wanted to do anything about it. Um, So, you know, as I grow into my research career, I, that's something that I'd love to explore and perhaps I can help with that legislation. Um, but as of now, it's extremely disappointing to see and hear those stories. Yeah. Opportunity, opportunity to, yeah. to make change. Make it better. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. We, we've been talking a good bit about uh, focusing a little bit on the genital side of things. There's oral. That's a fun statement. (laughs) I like that. (laughs) Title for the episode. Um, uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, oral STIs. Like, so we have general herpes, we have have oral herpes and there's others. What, why do you, for for starters, why do you think that uh, genital herpes tends to carry a higher stigma when so many people have oral herpes. Well, I'll start there and then maybe we can get into testing for a second. So I think it goes back to the post that you referenced in just our society's discomfort with the genitals. Like you said, we're getting genital about it Um, and just sex. And, you know, we're in America, we're such a sex saturated culture, Um, you know, very provocative and, people engaging in sex every day, all the time, fine. But when you come, when you confront the vulnerable side of sex, the, the, the side that isn't presented in the media, the, the STIs, um, the awkward conversations, the awkward sex noises, the stuff that you don't want to see when you're watching a movie or porn, you know, the, the non-romanticized version of sex. Mm-hmm. Um, it's this fantasy versus reality in my mind. Um, but I really just think there's a lot of intergenerational sexual shame and specifically tied to our genitals too. Yeah. And, and in regards to testing, I also wonder, cause so one of the things we've talked about this month as well, and have some resources for our home STI testing kits. Mm -hmm. And I, I've noticed again and again that oral kits are rare to non-existent. Um, 
and back to in- inclusion, like depending upon what your, your preference of, of how you have sex is like right. testing your genitals might not even be something right. that you need to worry about. Um, but oral might be, and to not even have an, uh, uh, an option, an option just, I don't know. If, I don't know if you have more information or why. I don't have or- more information, but it's something I've thought about recently because I get a lot of companies that reach out to me specifically about testing um, and, you know, wanting to partner and things like that. And, you know, I'm all for accessibility and I think it's great to have an accessible test that you can take at home. You know, if, if you don't have a doctor, especially during COVID, you know, things like things like that. But um, that's something that I wonder about too, or I'm cautious about, I should say or tests that specifically say, you know, well, we only test for HSV2. And it's like, well, that's nice. But what about general HSV1 or, you know, other STIs? You know, what What about those guys? Yeah. Um, and I haven't really gotten an answer for that. So that makes me wonder, is it a larger, you know, is that just companies wanting to make money? Um, you know, I'm not really sure. Right. Do but you- also, yeah. it kind of seems like it's just more of the ingrained like heteronormativity and just like penetrative sex is the only version of sex kind of mentality that is so saturated in our societies throughout history but But that could be an overthinking that's just my i don't think that's an overthinking i also you know some even the names of companies that I receive for partnership. I'm like, really? Like, that's not very uh, forward thinking or inclusive or, you know, and they'll use, you know, you'll risk, you'll receive emails and maybe you, you've received some too, where they, they try to use, you know, folks with the X or women with the X and, you know, things like that. But then when you look at, yeah, you know, but then you go and there's major eye rolls going on in several parts of this, this conversation. So when, but then you look in their websites and you, you know, and you look at, the research or whatever, you know, I'm like, who is this really for? Are you just, it's, I have, I said, you know, a long time ago, like inclusivity is not a trend and these companies are clearly trying to sell to that moment Mm -hmm. and not the population at large. Well, and then you have, you, you have the elitism and the privilege of these kits. I mean, the cost price point just immediately cuts out Availability isn't doesn't mean it's accessible. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and 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 we brought this up on another interview. It just it just seems baffling that something this beneficial for the population overall of of being a public health mm-hmm. issue basically is not more accessible, and that one of the few organizations that does bring accessibility to, to many people, Planned Parenthood, is so attacked. It, I, I, I don't even know if I have words. <laughs> I don't either. That's why I'm just like, ugh. <laughs> but we, but we, but we need to have words because right. it needs to be, <laughs> it needs to be addressed. Um, I'm, I'm curious, other than Planned Parenthood, are there local you know, brick and mortar resources that are affordable that you know of that are places people can go? I know in Philadelphia, there's the Mazzoni Center. Um, I'm in Philly, but, and I'm sure there might be a few STI testing clinics here and there, but again, I'm not sure, you know, if they offer herpes screening or testing, because again, not mandated, not sure. Um, I believe you might be able to order some through LabCorp, the test through LabCorp, but again, accessibility, I'm not sure what that price point is. And then you have to go take it to a lab and have someone do that. And not, not easily accessible for somebody right. who's younger either, because with these right. kids, you usually need a credit card, which you might not have. And you're probably not going to go get your parents' card. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> You don't want that showing up on their line. So, or, or even just being able to drive yourself somewhere. If that's... You- this is really interesting that you bring that up because I'm thinking, I'm like, when have I ever really seen STIs, not advertised, but STI testing advertised more to teens or adolescents? Mm-hmm. And I, I don't think I have. And that's where it needs to start. Mm-hmm. It needs to start yeah. earlier. Both to yeah. get in the habit of it, to create good foundations for, mm-hmm. for like knowing what your status is so that you can either not spread it or, you know, take precautions, whatever needs to happen. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously it helps destigmatize it if it's a regularly 
scheduled, you know, testing. Right. Um, I feel like that very much loops back to the need of an in-school advocate or like I have this vision right now of their, of a bus that's always like out front of a school. Yeah. And that's just like, that's where oh my you gosh, go. The magic school bus. Oh, the magic yes. Test school bus. <gasps> yes. But that would it, be awesome. <laughs> right. I want one. Yeah. Come on. Let's get on it. But it's so funny. Cause you know, I think I'm like my parents, uh, I was raised Catholic school. So obviously my sex ed was not very great, <laughs> um, but you know, you start hearing about cold sores when you're younger, younger, like, you know, your aunt or your grandma, like gave someone so a cold sore. So like, that would be a really great introduction for parents to even say, well, you know, there's other, you know, that's called herpes because that's a battle that I face with my followers and just people on the internet, uh, is people rejecting data. It's not even opinion. You are rejecting that it's herpes. You know, I'll say, well, cold sores are herpes. No, they're not. Like I don't have herpes. And there's this discomfort with the word herpes itself. It, you know, it's, it's an awkward, it's an awkward kind of saying word, like, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. it's, it's so fascinating to me how people, I saw a post recently. It said, you know, you're not, it's not an opinion. You're rejecting data. You're rejecting fact. <laughs> yeah. And I'm going to, I'm going to refrain from going on a tangent about this, but that makes me then think about how like parents have this responsibility too. Like this isn't just this is what you go to school for. Like, yes, this should be something that is included right. in our school education, but there's plenty of other like basic life aspects that we know also aren't included in our school education. So like maybe, maybe not, this should be in consideration uh, included in that. But as a parent and whatever a parenting course <laughs> should include and be in order to make sure that you're bringing the right education you know, the right example and the right education. Sex positive families is great resource as always for that. Yes. I send all of my friends with kids there. (laughs) Yes. I mean, if you know your kid is sexually active, you should like taking them with you to get tested is just like a great way to normalize it for them. You show that you're in it with them. Like you're also looking out for their health you go to the doctors with them. Why wouldn't you? Well, maybe once they're sexually active, you're not going to the doctors with them anymore, but probably you are. Cause my mom came with me until I was like 18. Yeah. Cause I didn't have a car and needed Yeah, a exactly. Or like I, it's just, we're getting a bunch done at one time. Right. Like go with your mom, go with your parent, like whoever it is that you're most comfortable with. But like doing that with your parents shows that, you know, there's no shame in it. There's no shame. And it's just looking out for yourself and looking out for your wellness. And I feel like that opens the conversation also between parents or caregivers or whomever. Mm -hmm. And then I have have one. Oh, totally. Um, Before we wrap up, I want to ask one more question, which is that a lot of people are, will assume if they're in a monogamous relationship and then their partner is diagnosed with herpes or an STI, that it means that they're, not faithful or that they have cheated on them. Is that true? No. So I'll speak to herpes specifically here because it's so difficult with testing and it's hard to navigate. Uh, It's hard to know when you have it because most people don't have a testing history. Um, Most people don't know they have it. You know, up to 90% of people have no idea that they have it because it's largely asymptomatic or they mistake it for razor burn or ingrown hairs. Um, you know, you're not tested for it. So how would you know? So, and you could have a partner who has cold sores, not know that that's herpes and that it could be transmitted genitally during oral sex. Um, So there are a lot of possibilities within monogamous relationships that a herpes diagnosis can arise that doesn't automatically mean that someone was cheating on you or went astray. Um, So I I think that's really important um, communication with couples. And, you know, I think that's really hard for people that to confront that because they might not have, you know, a page like mine or a page like yours to navigate that conversation. Um, their healthcare provider might not give them the correct information. I've had several people reach out to me saying, well, they said this and I'm like, oh my gosh, like, Ooh, that's a lot of trauma right there. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and some people might automatically run to couples therapy. But it's really, to me, this lapse in sex education and our lack of awareness around 
what it is, how we get it. Yeah. Therefore, how to communicate about it. And as you said, when you're not seeing it in the media, when you're not, or you're seeing these poor representations in the media. seeing jokes like, oh, well, at least it's not herpes. Mm -hmm. Right. At least it's not HIV. I think of, I was thinking of this earlier, we were talking about your education styles, blinking on the film, but you know, the classic, if you have sex, you will get chlamydia and die. (laughs) Mean girls. Yeah, mean girls, exactly. And that's just, I mean, it's, that's a pretty quintessential movie for a lot of things, but that's, that is, that, that, that's bad reality. Yeah. Of, of how we think about it. Yeah. Not reality, reality. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. For 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 every, for no, yeah. Um, well, Emily, thank you so much for joining us. This oh, thank you. This has been lovely. Very informative. Yes, thank you. We do want to loop back one more time. Can you share the kernel theory that you brought? Sure. So we all know at least one person, if not more, with or who has a sexually transmitted infection. And maybe a challenge to the listeners, if uh, even, well, quite frankly, whether that's you or not, in, in helping break down these stigmas, which is the theme, and create communication, maybe a call to action, is go and find that one person. Because without question, yeah, it, it's somebody. And maybe in having those conversations, maybe you might be able to also enlighten somebody that even if it is a cold sore or something else of, of how they're calling it, they can understand that it is, it is herpes. And in just labeling it as what it is can help to break things down, break the stigma down. Yeah. Thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in today. And we hope that this episode's given you something further to reflect upon. Uh, Reach out to us with any of your questions or insights that you've gained from this on our Instagram page at Carnal Theory. And also, please check out Emily's work. You can head to emilydepass.com or you can find her on Instagram at Sex Education. That's Sex E L D U C A T I O N. Thank you, Emily. Thank you so much. Carnal Theory is produced by My Sex Bio. Our sound design is by Audrey Cohane, and our theme music by Men the Universe. My Sex Bio is an educational platform built to empower people like you to take command of your sexual biography. Follow us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, TikTok, YouTube, and Spotify at My Sex Bio. Visit our website and join our e-letter at MySexBio.org and support our work by joining our Patreon. Thank you.